Hi, I'm Steve Gravestock. I'm a senior program at the Toronto International Film Festival. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Tia Lindeberg to the uh, to the digital stage, I guess. Uh, so please welcome her, however you do digitally. Uh, Thank uh, you so much. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for the film. Uh, T, of course, directed As in Heaven, the film you just saw. Um, congrats on the film. Uh, um, it's a very powerful and, and moving piece. Uh, uh, wanted to, um, I guess, start by asking about, um, I mean, to me, one of the things that really struck me about the film is that it's, uh, what's really quite striking about the film is that the setting is, you know, remote historically. I mean, it's in, in some ways it's more than a, a century and a half ago, yet it also feels quite contemporary in terms of the issues that the characters uh, face, the issues at least the, the heroine, the main character, uh, struggles with or issues that people confront in today's world. Um, obviously, a divide between faith and science, uh, but also the obstacles women face in, you know, in certain societies, well, mm -hmm. probably a lot of societies, uh, pursuing education, pursuing the direction they want to. Do you want to talk about, uh, you know, that kind of, it's kind of like a not that distant mirror, really, so... Yeah, I mean, um, I it's based on a small book that was written in the nineteen in 1912 by a female Danish author, and it's actually quite an unknown book. And I read it, uh, yeah, nine years ago, and um, it just struck me right away. I mean, how important these, I mean, not just the whole every time a woman goes into labor, there's a chance that either she's going to die or the baby is going to die, but also... I mean, for me, I think the most striking was like the children in it and how they were looking into the adult world and how they were unable to do anything but just, you know, watch and pray and hope for the best. But um, for me, it was never it was never like I read it and I thought this, I had a political agenda, but it has definitely become that. I mean, somehow it's become a very feminist film and it hit like right now in a time where these are issues that are yeah really um up for debate <laughs> and i do believe but i and i also do believe i mean it's it's an extremely important thing because even though in our parts of the society no one really goes to the hospital giving birth thinking there's a chance they'll die they mostly hope like that the baby's gonna come out and they can't wait for it but in many parts of the world, that's really still the reality. And 800 women die every day of either pregnancy or giving birth. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, can you talk a bit about the, the author? It's uh, Maria Bergendahl. And um, I mean, you mentioned how you, how did you find the book? Uh, uh, and if you could talk a bit about her place in, in Danish literature, I mean, maybe what drew you to the story. Uh, I guess I also want to know how her, is her take on rural life different from other authors of the period? Is it, uh, um, you know, if you could explain There, that. I mean, the thing is there aren't that many female authors who wrote about the female roles and destinies during that time. And it was quite an unknown book. I mean, it's always been on my mom's bookshelf growing up. And I've always looked at the title in Danish, the original title is A Night of Dying basically, if you translate it. And I always felt like there's something super compelling and drawing with that title. And um, yeah, and then I just took it out. It's actually quite short and I read it and she's someone who is known in very small circles, but she hasn't been part of the big Danish author. Um, yeah, like uh, she hasn't been recognized, I think, for what she's done and um, it's, it's loosely based on her own childhood. So it's autobiographical in that, in that sense. And, um, and she was married to a very well-known Danish um, author and um, songwriter. And he got all the praise and he's in the Danish canon of like the best yeah, authors in Denmark, but she's not. So uh, I hope that um, more people will read her because it's a, quite an amazing book. And the difference between the book, I mean, of course, I have fictionalized over the book and the book is more written with like an all knowing perspective. There is no main character. It's more like 
kind of like someone looking like a god looking down on humans and how they act in this situation with the birth being the whole um, frame of the story. But to me, it was definitely the oldest uh, girl, Lisa, who somehow like, yeah, she really hit me because it's her life and she has to take over the mother from the, or the role from the mother and she has to become the new, yeah, woman on the farm. So uh, I felt her story to me was the most, yeah, important <laughs> and intriguing. Yeah, I, th I think that's one of the, um, I mean, it, it I, 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 one of the things I really admired about the film is how it, you know, it shows uh, um, how social change and possibility are played out on a, on a very sort of micro level, but it has sort of larger consequences because, you know, this, um, it's, it's the, you know, it's it's primarily Lisa's story, the family story, but mm -hmm. you know what happens to her is an indicative of uh, uh, you know what happens in the wider society in a lot of ways. Yeah, or, yeah, because her disappointments are the uh, social disappointments as well. Yes, for sure. Um, do you, uh, I also I, I love the way um, uh, you approach the period uh, because it's sort of. Um, uh, you know, there's uh, there's no condescension to any of the characters. Uh, you know, even when they're kind of when we see when, from our perspective today, we see them as sort of, you know, people like Old Cine, who on one level is like a really, you know, repressive or negative force in the story. She refuses to get a doctor. She emphasizes faith above everything. Yet you also feel that she's got her own sort of limitations on what she can do because she's you know she's trying to honor. Um, her mistress is, you know, she has, the, the mother has misgivings about doctors, which many of us do. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I, and I, I, you know, similarly, the, um, uh, you know, I mean, the mother's emphasis on educating her daughter and then she's afraid of doctors, right? Or medicine or, or whatever. And I, I yes. love that you, you know, you, you got, that, that's very present in the story. Thank you. Yeah. The, the, <laughs> Is there, is there, is, I mean, how do you get, sort of get into that? Um, was it a leap to get into that headspace or is it? Uh, uh, um, know, that I mean, I, the whole thing about her leaving and going away to school is actually something that I put in the movie. It was not in the original story. Um, and I felt that was very important also to emphasize everything that she's losing. I mean, so she's not just losing her mother, she's losing her whole future. And um, and the way I approach the characters is I really tried to understand where they were coming from. I mean, because you still you still really feel that old Cena loves Anna, the mother, her mistress. Yeah. And she's like you said, just trying to honor her. Yeah, her uh, vision of what's going to happen. And I think old Cena also believes that vision. So it's not just honoring it. It's like if you have a vision, you have to believe it. Just like Lisa. I mean, she also has a vision in the very beginning, but she doesn't believe it. She doesn't lean into it. It's actually telling her something horrible is going to happen. Still, she wakes up and she focuses on being in love and being young and being carefree and not taking that um, seriously until it like comes back to her and like gets her <laughs> and haunts yeah. her. And I mean, yeah. not that she could necessarily have done anything because that's also a point It's like, Destiny is destiny, and all you can do is try to just rise and meet it. But you can't really change it. I mean, you can you can try to navigate, but life is life, and shit happens. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, well, that that's definitely true. Uh, the uh, um, do you uh, can you talk a bit about how you uh, approach the uh, uh, I, I mean, the film has a very striking, but also a kind of naturalist look in a, in a, in a, in a lot of ways. You want to talk about that, how you approach the visuals, because it, it does feel, it, you know, you do feel like you've entered a a, a, a different world, uh, you know, a, a world that's a century, more than a century ago. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, there's several things. I mean, because we worked uh, with the whole set design to do a very naturalistic look, like we wanted it to look like it did. Um, 
And then we worked with the cinematography. We were very early on, the cinematographer and I, uh, Marcel Siskin, uh, agreed upon that we needed to do this on film. And so we shot it on 16 millimeter and it gave it that sense of realness and graininess. And also we liked all the flaws. We liked the hair in the lens and we wanted to keep all that. And the same time we wanted to um, make it make this world really beautiful so so that the horror and the sorrow somehow was in contrast with the beauty or or the same you know like and um and then we worked a lot with um the kids can't sometimes they feel they can do something they can i mean they can uh, they can change uh, yeah they can act and uh, and when we're with the kids and they feel that they can act, the camera is moving with them and gliding with them. But then uh, there are periods where um, time just stands still because the kids are, they don't know what to do. So we framed them as in the, we like froze them, kept them inside a frame so they can't move and they can't get out. So time was very uh, much something we had in mind in how we shot it. Um, and then we worked a lot with sound because there is no um, underlying music in the film uh, except for when the, they're singing or they're, they're playing music. And, um, and that made the sound design so much uh, more important in a way. And we worked with a very documentary sound, uh, which was like we were researching. So how does the insect sounds in the 1880s, there were a lot more insects than we have now. Uh, what kind of birds were there? So that and the whole feel of the farm. How does the wood sound? How does the, the yeah the, the certain shoes they would use when they walk? And at the same time, we worked with a very subjective sound, which was uh, how Lisa is feeling. So when we got into her head, it was like this is how she feels. This is how she hears the world. So it was a yeah the balance between those two, and I think that uh, yeah. Um, eliminated the music. <laughs> it some, somehow did what the music would have done. And um, yeah, so those were some of the elements we worked with. It's uh, it's uh, interesting. I'm doing a, um, there's another a Canadian film we're showing that's set in the same, a similar time period. And they, um, and they're clearing a land for a farm. And it's like, you'd expect that things would be quieter or you'd hear more insects, but instead they're chopping wood. So it's like you're in the middle of a fat, you're in like a, a next door to a factory because the chopping wood, like yes. four, four people chopping down trees is very loud. <laughs> uh, 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 but I, those are daring choices in a lot of ways, like to shoot without, you know, not have a, a, a you know, a, a, a soundtrack or, you know, music. People often use that to sort of propel you know, draw the emotions in 16 mil. How did people, when you say you were going to shoot in 16 mil and not have a score? Uh, what, <laughs> well, <laughs> what I think the producers, they they freaked a little bit with the 16 millimeter, <laughs> especially because we had such a short time to shoot it. It was doing COVID. We had lots of elders. We had so many kids. We had animals. Uh, we were dependent on the weather. We have so many exterior shots because it also takes place over 24 hours. So the weather needs to be consistent in where we are in the time. Um, so there were a lot of elements that could have uh, gone wrong, <laughs> but uh, but I, it, it worked out. And I think we I think we all very. I mean, they were on board, of course, the producers. I mean, once we like, yeah. we got to do sure. this. And I would say doing editing, we definitely sometimes were like, because we had to imagine like, what's the sound going to be? And, and the sound designer was in on it and he made like some contemporary sound to certain scenes. But it mm -hmm. wasn't until we were uh, uh, sound working on the sound that it kind of came together, the feelings and the different scenes. And so it was, I mean, we definitely under underway had some like, oh no, is this the wrong choice? Should we have music? But at the same time, I felt like we would have it would have been suffocating. Like I I didn't want to put like that element over this documentary-ish film. So um yeah, I, I'm I'm glad we stuck to it. <laughs> yeah, and I think the <laughs> yeah, me too. The uh, uh I, I'm I think that the you know the 
the, the emotions in the story speak for themselves. Like, like I said, often music is used as a, a kind of, uh, you know, prompt responses. And, uh, and also I think, you know, I mean, when you think about the, the period, like uh, obviously anything would be, any music would have to be done live. Right. So, you know, you'd have yes. to have a musician there. So, uh, and you know, th I mean, that does make the sort of, you know, when the when the farmhands are dancing and singing and stuff, it's it's a different. You know, it it, it adds an element to it that I, it it actually may, indicates why it's special, or like a kind of uh, you know an event that's different from the sort of day to day work on a farm. Mm, um, I mm. think. So, um, I wanted to. Um, um, uh, I, I I really like the way the differences between. Uh, um, you know the different sectors in in in, in the family and on the, on the uh, on the farm are played out. Like the different sort of uh, you know the girls are are when they're together they're gossiping and there's not like a you know there's sort of different cliques that work. Like it doesn't matter what you know what part of the family or what part of the farm they're on. They they're together to talk about certain things and uh, um, do you know what I mean? I mean it's sort mm -hmm. of like, these little groups uh, mm. uh and you know like lisa is sort of um you know closer to old cindy's daughter because she has sort of has this faith in science or education or you know these sort of uh i love the way that played out and it went it went across lines that you wouldn't expect it to in a way i'm happy <laughs> <laughs> um that scene where the the girls are there gossiping is is and then and you know i mean and the whole thing with the the stuff about faith is really interesting because like Lee sort of takes it upon herself. She feels very guilty at a certain point about how she's treated, you know, she's failed her mother and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. which I thought, you know, quite powerful. Yeah. I think, I mean, Lisa's whole um, connection with God is in its own, is in a way its own storyline throughout the film as well. I mean, when she, when we start out, she has a very, childish um relationship with god like he's there she believes him but she's never really needed him for anything and, and and throughout the film she more and more leans towards that's the only thing we can do i can't do anything in this situation all i have right now is god and i mean i like one of the most important scenes to me in the film is the one where they try to the, all the girls at night try to pray to God and say the prayer. But when they got to the part where will his will happen or may his will happen, however it's translated in English, um, she can't get through the prayer because what if Will's is what if God's will is to take mom? And I think that's like a big turning point for her. And she goes out and then she leans all in and she finds her own way to pray. And God answers her. But in the end, she can't change his will. He's saying, I'm here, but I'm doing what I'm going to do. And you can, you know, you can pray as much as you want, but this is still going to happen and it still happens. Mm -hmm. Well, that also makes it very timely too. Uh, well, congratulations <laughs> on the film. Uh, uh, so Thank you really so much. Impressive piece of work. Uh, one of the best debuts I've seen in, in a while. So thanks. Thank thanks you. Thank you. I really um, appreciate it. And uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Yeah. <laughs> see you soon. <laughs>